I'm now coordinated, okay. We want to welcome you to the Albany Seventh-day Adventist Church. <laughs> it's been a busy week. It's always nice to be able to just set it all aside, turn down the volume, settle back, and enjoy Sabbath. <clears throat> There's just a couple things that I want to um, bring to your attention here uh, as we begin our Sabbath school, some housekeeping things. This is um, the 13th Sabbath of the quarter. However, we have one more study in our lesson for next Sabbath, and that will then finish this study. If you are interested in picking up the new quarterly for the next quarter, the last quarter of 2023, you can talk with either Judy out in the front, um, Judy Taylor, or Kathy Jensen. Thank you. Uh, they're the two ladies who are working with that. So if you want to pick that up, why don't hesitate to get that for today. Okay, uh, before we begin our Sabbath school, I, I invite you to bow your heads and let's have prayer. <clears throat> Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for your love, your care, your patience with us. We thank you that you have given us this Sabbath. We thank you for the opportunity of opening your word. And we ask that you would please help us to know how to live but also how to participate with you in the great controversy battle that is going on. Please send your Holy Spirit to bless us and guide us. We pray these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. To sort of set the stage for our Sabbath school here, I want to ask you a question. I'm not quite sure how to pronounce this lady's name. Yacinda Ardern, I believe, is how you pronounce her name. I'm going to ask you a little question, a trivia question here. Can anybody identify for me where this lady is standing? Where is this lady standing? She is standing in front of a green wall. That green wall is a clue as to where she is standing. She's actually, I'm sorry? What's that? Okay, close. Um, she's actually standing in front of the um, United Nations uh, General Assembly. And she gave a speech to the United Nations delegates. I think sometime in the last week or two. You say, well, why are you bringing this up? Well, this lady, Yacinda Ardern, is actually the um, ex-prime uh, ex minister, I believe, of New Zealand. She currently holds two fellowship positions at Harvard University. And she is in charge of, let's see, what is she, does she have a title? I'm not sure what she is, what she has a title on. Anyway, what was, her, what was the focus of her speech? The focus of her speech is, in her speech, she noted that we, and when she uses the term we, she is referring to uh, herself, but also everybody who is listening to her, which in this setting is the United Nations delegates. So she's speaking to the United Nations delegates. She says, we cannot allow free speech. Just think about that for a moment. We cannot allow free speech to get in the way of fighting things and I'm going to paraphrase, things that we think are important. Now, in her particular case, this particular speech, what she is talking about is climate change. So let me rephrase that, reread that again. 
She notes that we cannot allow free speech to get in the way of fighting things like climate change. She notes that they cannot win the war on climate change if people do not believe them about the underlying problem. The solution is to silence those with opposing views. It is that simple. Now think about that. Ex-Prime Minister of New Zealand. She, by the way, was the Prime Minister of New Zealand during the COVID era. I'm going to use that term in a generic way. Can anybody tell me what happened in New Zealand during the COVID era? Um, New Zealand had some of the most harsh, draconian lockdowns, shutdowns, vaccine mandates in the world. And she was the one who pushed this from day one. They what now? Yes, until it showed up. And then, of course, it's kind of now endemic like it is around the world. So it's no different. End result, no different. Um, so I, I bring this to us as sort of a background in terms of our lesson today. Because I think our lesson segues right into this type of thing. Let me ask you a question. How important do you think free speech is in relationship to the Gospel Commission? If you don't have free speech, can you be a gospel commissioner? Yeah, because we know what? We know that the plan is to shut down the gospel. Let me ask you this question. Another article that I read this week. Do you know what the fastest religion is in America today? And when I say fastest religion, this is what I mean. This is what people identify as. They identify as a, and you can define whatever that is. So it isn't just a, well, we think this is what's happening out there. This is what people are identifying it. What is the fastest growing religion in America today? Atheism. Atheism, I'll give you half a point. You're close. What's that? LGBTQ. Ah, <laughs> okay. Um, paganism. People who identify as, I am a pagan. I mean, I don't think about that as a religion. But that is what is the fastest growing worldview, explanation about what, of how things work in the great cosmos, so to speak. It's paganism. And what is the focus of paganism typically? The worship of, be specific, worship of nature, worship of the, the, the climate, that sort of thing. So these are things that are happening, and these are things that we need to be aware of. Okay, <clears throat> now... Last week, I kind of fumbled when it came to the lesson study because I didn't realize that last week and this week are, are looking at the same verses in two different ways. I think Donna did, but I didn't catch up on that very quickly. <clears throat> so today we're going to go over the lesson and it's going to be a little bit of a review of last week to kind of tie that together with what we're going to talk about this week. So we're looking at Ephesians 6, 
verses 10 through 20. <clears throat> and again, just as a little review, <clears throat> Ephesians 4 and 5 focuses on Christian submission, daily relationships such as marriage, parents, slaves, etc. And we transition in Ephesians 6 into a completely different set of language. We now talk about military. We're using military terms. We're talking about battles and armament, which seems very odd, you know, to juxtaposition those two things side by side. <clears throat> okay, again, Ephesians 4 through 5 focuses on self-surrender in the matters of daily life. Ephesians 6 focuses on standing in the power of God in a cosmic war. Now think about that. Daily life on the one hand, cosmic war on the other hand. I have a hard time dealing with one, let alone <laughs> two. And yet, let me ask you a question. So, so let me ask you this question. <clears throat> when was the last time you thought about your daily life? And, you know, I look around this room here and I see a whole age span. Everybody's living different daily lives. When was the last time you thought of what's happening in your daily life as having relevance within the context of a cosmic war? I tend to get so focused on my daily life that I forget what's really happening in the big picture. I think I see Jim nodding his head there. So, <clears throat> summary. Let's bring Ephesians 4 and 5 and 6 together. Our daily interactions are the battlefield of the great controversy. I think that's a very, very important point to keep in mind. If we don't understand how we fit into the big picture, we may not even be participating in the big picture in a engaged way. We're just kind of drifting this way and drifting that way and slamming up against the rocks on this side and slamming up against the pillars on this side. And, and it's just like, wow, this is overwhelming me. We're missing the fact that we are part of a much, much bigger picture. Okay. <clears throat> So let's look at Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 20. We read it last time. I'm going to read it again because I think it helps us put this all together again. So Ephesians 6, verses 10 through uh, 12 reads as follows. <clears throat> finally, Paul says, finally, he's kind of wrapping things up. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but rather against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Verse 13, therefore, because of this situation, this is what you need to do. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, verse 18, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all power and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, 
that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 20. Okay, now, I want to try to help us get a big picture here. I want you to consider Romans 10, verse 15. This is Paul again reading, writing, and Romans 10, verse 15 makes the following statement. He says, And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Now notice that the phrase, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news, is in quotes. So what does that imply? It implies that this that Paul is quoting from somewhere else, from something that somebody else has said. And in fact, that's exactly what he's doing. He's quoting from where? The book of Isaiah. Because in the book of Isaiah, in chapter 52, verse 7, it reads the following. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Now, let me ask you a question. Who is Isaiah talking about when he makes this statement? Jesus. 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 Full point. So Isaiah is referring to Jesus here in Isaiah 52, and Paul is quoting what Isaiah has written. Now, Isaiah has some other things to say. Let's look at Isaiah 59. Isaiah 59, verses 17 through 19. And let's read that. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. And he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. Verse 19. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. Now, I've highlighted some things in the text here. It's, it, it, or excuse me, before I do the, go there, verse 17, it says, for he, let me ask you a question. Who is the he? Jesus Christ. Now, let me ask you a question. What do you see in these verses that remind you of what we've just read in Ephesians? Armor, says Sir Jim. That's exactly. Yeah, but, but, but all of these things are what? They're armor. That's exactly right. I'm going to give you a point. I was reminded last week that I had not given Donna a point. So I've given Donna a point. So now I've got that checked off. <laughs> okay. So <clears throat> notice who is wearing armor? Jesus is wearing armor. Now, let me ask you this question. When was the last time that you thought of Jesus as having to need armor. What's that? Okay, so in other words, yeah, you get a point, thank you, thank you, yes ma'am. <laughs> oh dear, I gotta really keep talking to have the points today. <laughs> okay. You need a point? How about when Jesus battled against Lucifer in heaven? 
Okay, even before then. We don't know much about what happened up there, but we do know what happened down here on this earth. Okay. I, I don't know what armor was needed up there, but the point that I think is being made here <clears throat> is the, the point that I want you to understand is this. In order for Christ to successfully beat back, resist, be victorious over Satan, he needed what? He needed armor. No, that's not the answer, Kelly. He needed armor. Okay? And that is what Isaiah is talking about here. And that is what Paul is referring to when he talks about armor in relationship to what he's writing in Ephesians. Now, let me ask you this question. Was the armor that Christ had and used effective? Yes. Everybody says what? Yes. yes. I'll give you a point. <laughs> okay. So the armor that Christ wore was effective. It is what allowed him made it possible for him to defeat the powers of darkness when he walked on this earth as a human being. Now, let me ask you this question. Is the armor that Paul is talking about in Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 20, different armor than what Christ walked with and used. No. They are the same armor. Let me ask you this question. Where does the armor that Paul is talking about, where does it come from? It is armor that is given to you and I, made available to you and I, by whom? By Christ. He has used it, it has been successful, and he has now made it available to you and I in our daily life. Is that good news? Yes. Absolutely. Every part of that armor represents Christ. Every part, from salvation to the shoes of readiness for the gospel. Well, well every part of that is him. So he's covering us. Um, I, I think I understand what you're saying. I don't, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make one little distinction here. I'm not going, I don't want to, to equate the armor with Christ. Christ used the armor in order to be successful in his dealings with Satan, which is exactly the same thing that you and I need over here in our dealings with Satan. Yes, Dale. That's not a side point. I'll give you a point. Absolutely. Yes, it is. It is a very, very good example. Okay. Now, I actually, I like the direction she's going. And the reason is because when we take the position that when we start to break down the armor into these individual components, sure. we need faith, we need righteousness, etc. We start to see them as almost commodities that we can buy, put on ourselves, and become <laughs> righteous, right? Okay. But Without Christ. Yeah. The, the only way that any of this is any good okay. is by um, Christ's righteousness. Really what this speaks to is Christ's righteousness coming upon yeah. us. It's not something that's separate from Christ. Yes. And so you can't have it. So I'm trying to make it stand on all four legs. You're making it on a much more greater. So Donna, I'll have to give you a point again because he just told me. Okay. Yes, Kelly. Yes, absolutely. Okay, yes, uh, George. Uh, when we were given the gospel commission, 
Yes. You, you can't go out without that armor. Um, exactly. Uh, what good would it be if you didn't have it? Yeah. The point that I want you to hear, though, is that this is armor that has been proven to be effective. And it was proven to be effective by Jesus Christ. And it is from him that we receive the armor as we move forward. Okay, so the armor Christ bids us wear in our struggle against Satan is the very armor which Christ himself was victorious against him. After his victory against Satan, Christ bequeathed the weapons of his warfare to you and I. To me, I think that's fantastic. I think that is amazingly good information. Okay. Um, okay, this is the, we've read this text here. This is where the different pieces of armor are, are found. And in fact, Ephesians uh, 10, uh, six, excuse me, 6, 10 through 17 lists these six different pieces of armor. The belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes, uh, the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of Christ. Now, yes, number two is the breastplate of righteousness. Yes. Um, now, something that I want you to think about is this. Paul also has in Galatians 5, verses 22 through 23, a, another list, and this is the list of the fruit of the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit that he lists here is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, question for you. The fruit of the Spirit, is that something that's supposed to be evident in our lives? Yes. Okay. Everybody says yes. Is it some of these? Or is it all of them? All of them. We don't get to pick and choose. Okay, I'm a joyful person, so I think I qualify for that, and so I don't need to worry about the rest. No. It's understood. Paul is saying, if the Spirit is active in your life, all of these are going to be at play. George, yes. Fruit is singular, not fruits. So it is all of them. I'm sorry? So it is fruit. It's one fruit is made up of all of these things. Yes. Okay. So you could look at this as uh, the texture and the flavor and the juiciness and all that. All of this combined makes the fruit itself. Jeannie, yes. Those are all the vitamins in that fruit. These are all the vitamins in the fruit. Okay. Very good. <laughs> okay. The, I'm sorry. Yes. When you are a very dominant person, it is very hard to have self-control. When you're a very dominant person, it's very hard to have self-control. That may be true, but as one who has the, if, you, if the Spirit of, of God is, is active in your life, the fruit will manifest itself in all of these characteristics. The point I'm trying to get to is this. The armor of God includes all six of the things that are listed here. It is not just one or two or three. It is all of them. It is a complete package. It is within that context that the Christian has confidence in terms of what God is doing in his life. So, <clears throat> we want to look at this as a complete package. Um, we talked about this last week, schemes of the devil. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. This is a, this is something that is, is, it, it, I don't think it's, it's outside it. Now let me start over. Um, 
we're, we're talking about a, um, a spiritual battle, not a, not a physical battle as such. Okay, <clears throat> so let's look at these different elements that we have listed by Paul in Ephesians. And um, let's begin with the belt of truth. Now, by the way, is Paul talking about literal armor here? No. These are ex this is to help us understand things from a, as, a, as a concept, as a way of thinking, as a way of living, okay? So what is, what, why, what is the importance of a belt? Hold your pants up. Yeah, okay. <laughs> oh my, let me ask you a question. Have you, have you seen any pictures, YouTube things of these guys that wear these pants that are about four or five sizes bigger than they need to wear and they kind of wear them right down about here? Have you seen that? Okay. Have you seen these guys try to walk? Have you seen them try to run? It's really quite hilarious to watch them. Okay. <clears throat> what would think? I'm sorry. One thing we don't usually see is seeing them try to work. Oh, yeah. They don't. That's <laughs> right. Okay. So what would a belt do for these gentlemen? Okay. It keeps things where they belong. All right. So, Paul is talking about a Roman soldier. Now, Roman soldiers didn't typically wear um, clothes like we wear, but they did wear a tunic, and they may have worn breeches. The focus of the belt would be to do what? Number one, it allows them to be mobile. Is mobility important in the Christian life? All right. Yes. Now, and again, I'm, I'm using the, the word mobility, it, both in a literal sense, in other words, the ability to move from point A to point B. But is there a, is there a figurative sense that we think of mobility? A confidence. Yes. A point there. The, the ability to understand what's going on, uh, to, to respond accordingly. Does the Christian find himself confronted with an ever-changing environment in which one has to adapt and be able to respond in a way that brings honor and glory to God? Yes. Absolutely. Yes, Donna. The belt for a soldier was for protection. A belt of truth for us is for protection. Oh, okay, so, so now, that's, now let's go to the second Let's go to the second part of this. It's not just a belt, but it's a specific kind of belt. What kind of belt is it? Belt of truth. So, let me ask you this question. Where does truth come into the, um, the experience of the Christian? Because of love. What's that? Because of love. Yeah, okay, I'll give you a point. But what is, okay, again, let's go back up here. I want to ask you this question here. Uh, let's see if I can find it here. Oh, I went the wrong way. Um, let's notice here. Uh, look at this word. Oh, I don't have my pointer here. What does it say here? What is it something about the devil? Schemes, Schemes of the devil. What is the point of a scheme of a devil? What do we call that? Okay. Um, it's called ambush is that the experience of a soldier yes. in other words if you are if you're sauntering around and really not paying attention and don't know what's going on you could get ambushed and it doesn't make any difference if you got your belt on and everything else down you go so truth 
helps you stay grounded in terms of the reality of the environment that you and I live in. And the number one thing we have to recognize is that there is a devil out there and it is his goal to take you down if at any point in time he can. Donna. The opposite of truth is lies. Yeah, very good. <clears throat> Right. But that's where the schemes come in. I mean, schemes are typically lies. And the belt of truth that means that we just don't have the Bible in our house. We read the Bible and put it in our heads and our hearts. So it's information that is in our head that we can use on a moment by moment basis. Okay, very good. Now let me ask you this question. Breastplate of righteousness. What is the purpose of the breastplate what is behind the breastplate heart lungs vital organs <clears throat> all right um, the breastplate of righteousness now um, let's see You've heard the phrase um, in the Bible, in spiritual things, we refer oftentimes to one's heart. What, what is that really referring to? Mind. Our mind. Okay. So, What is righteousness? What, what is another? How would you describe, define the word righteousness? Right doing. Okay. If you are wearing a, a belt of truth in which God has provided us information through his word, that gives us a confidence as to how to live our lives. And the breastplate protects our being. In relationship to that living. George, yes. But we are also told we are the salt of the earth. And you can also be too salty. Too salty. Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, again, this is where discernment, I think, comes into the equation. In other words, there are times to, to, to engage and fight. And there are times to maybe step back and, and, and allow the enemy to exhaust himself in front of you. <clears throat> yes. I think that's where the Holy Spirit also comes into the play, is the listing there. Okay. <clears throat> um, when we are clothed in righteousness, we are impregnable. Words are no defense against accusations, but a good life is. Okay. Are we as Christians accused of certain things? Do we defend ourselves through our words, or is it better to defend ourselves through our actions? Actions speak louder than... Words. That's exactly right. The only way to meet the accusations against Christianity is to show how good a Christian can be through God's leading. Yes, Paul, son. Yeah, I, I'm going to disagree with that. Okay. The, the only way to defend against accusations is to show the goodness of God. To show the goodness of God. Okay, yes. I want to point out that everything in this analogy of armor is external to the soldier, okay? External to the soldier, okay, yes. So in other words, when the soldier puts on the belt of truth, yes. that is not his truth. That truth is external to him, okay? Yes. When he puts on the breastplate of righteousness, <clears throat> that is not his righteousness. Correct. Okay? So as a Christian, yes, our lives will be changed by God. But the reality is we all sin and fall short of God. And it is not showing this is what a good Christian looks like. It is by saying, you are correct. I have sinned. I have failed. But it is Christ's righteousness that covers me. And that is how I can stand. Okay. Good point. I'll have to give you two points for that. And Ethan, you're probably in line for two points here also. So help us here. So uh, I like the direction that Paul is going here. Um, in the passage that we looked at, Isaiah 59, which is really the... Where Paul is, I believe, getting a lot yes. of ideas here. Yes, so, I agree. Um, the verse before what you read, verse 16, it says, well, actually, I'll start in 15, because it also bears into the 
conversation. It says, Truth is lacking, and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. The Lord saw it and it displeased him. Lift your Bible up and read out to us. Okay. The Lord saw it and it displeased him that there was no justice. He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no one to intercede. Then his own arm brought him salvation, and his righteousness upheld him. Yes. It goes on to say, okay. Wrestling, right? So this is pointing to the idea that God's in the whole passage before this. Right. God notices at the beginning of the passage that sin has caused a separation between us and God. Yes. And then it goes on. He's basically surveying the landscape and seeing that there's no righteousness here. Right. And there's nobody to intercede for right. them. And then truth is lacking. Right. Which is interesting because that's where Paul starts this idea of truth. And then, so he says, well, I will come and I will intercede. And it is my righteousness right. that I will wear. So, so the point... So the point that these two men have made over here, which I think is a very, very valid point, and that is that this armor is not something that we have inherently. It is something that is external to us. And it is, and it is provided to us by God, not something that we come up with ourselves. Yes? It is external, but... It comes from an external source. Okay. Um, if you don't internalize it, you don't have it. Right. And, uh, and so would another way of, of saying that being the armor has to be used in order for it to be useful. Yes. That's okay. Yes. Yes. Indeed. Okay. Um, time is running out. <clears throat> So, so let me ask you, um, I, I'm going to let you go through these other pieces of armor. <clears throat> what is the very last thing, though, that Paul identifies needs to be a part of this soldier who is wearing the armor that God has provided? Pray. To pray. To pray. Okay. Pray in the Spirit on all occasions. Oh dear. <laughs> what's, the, what's, the, what's the word there that, gets, that creates problems for me and you? In all occasions. You know, I, I, I remember to pray at certain points in time, but I can tell you it isn't all occasions. That's when I really, where I fail. With all kinds of prayer and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all of God's people. So, um, I think the way I, the, the way I would look at this is this. <clears throat> God provides us the armor. And God also provides us with insight as to how to use that armor through the Spirit. And the way the Spirit has access to us is when we are reaching out to Him and asking for direction in terms of how to live, use that armor. So think about that in terms of your daily life. Think about that in relationship to what you do from day to day or don't do from day to day. So, he provides us with armor, but he's not going to, he's not going to, um, he's not going to be heavy handed in terms of how you use that armor, unless you are reaching out to him. And uh, through prayer, through prayer. Thank you. Kel. I'll give you a point for that. Okay. <clears throat>
to be distracted. That's exactly right. So I want, to, I want you to, to consider these, ver this, these, these thoughts. <clears throat> we, must, we, must, we must put the armor on, and then what? <laughs> and keep it on. <laughs> you know, we must keep, put it on and keep it on. <clears throat> and then what? Fight manu manfully the battles of the Lord, and having done all, Stand ready for what? Another conflict. Oh my. Does that re can you relate to that? You know, you just you just get something quote under control. You get the fire burnt, you know, knocked down. It's finally you can stop and take a breath and, and put your feet up and relax for a few minutes. And boom, what happens? There's another one. And another one, and another one. We must not think that we are the generals, <clears throat> but we are under the mighty general of armies. Let us, let us pray as never before. Let us believe with heart and soul the words of John, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. It is a poor time when in the fierce conflict to show one particle of cowardice. We have a general who never lost a battle, have faith in God, and we shall, what? Gain the victory. And the victory is gained because we are wearing whose armor? The armor that Christ wore, the armor that he has bequeathed to us, and the armor that if we keep on, will actually allow us to successfully live through his grace. <clears throat> Let us pray. Father in heaven, forgive us, forgive us, forgive us for not putting the armor on, not keeping the armor on, not using the armor, and not reaching out through, to your spirit to guide us in how to use that armor. I ask that you would bless each one here today. Help us to recognize what you will and want to do for each of us. Please bless us as we continue to worship you. May we bring honor and glory to you in all that we say and do. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.